It's nice to see you tonight. We have visitors with us. We're glad to have you. Always welcome. Encourage you to get your Bible and come with us to the book of Proverbs for chapter 22 tonight. If you need a lesson sheet, raise your hand. We'll see that you get a copy. We're on page 61 of the material, letter I, that's Proverbs 22 and verse 9. It reads, He that hath a bountiful eye shall be blessed, for he giveth of his bread to the poor. Do you know what a bountiful eye is? You could make a study of Bible eyes. There are different kind of eyes mentioned in this book. Are you aware of that? If you had a concordance that gives an alphabetical listing of every word in this book, and you look up the word eye and explore that, you'll find lots of different kinds of eyes. It makes a good study in of itself. But what in the world is a bountiful eye? Becky? Okay. Whatever it is, I know I want to have it. Don't you? Because he that hath a bountiful eye shall be what? Blessed. You like to be blessed, Eric? That appeal to you? So we need to have that kind of eye, don't we? Jason? What is a bountiful eye? Well, it's, it's a bird, Good. This passage helps to identify and define what that's about, doesn't it? When it says, for he what? Giveth. He that hath a bountiful eye is what kind of a person? John? Giver. Giver, a giving person. How does he give? Bountifully? What's another word for that? Liberally. Or? Generously. Does the Bible use the word bountiful in connection with giving? in other places besides Proverbs 22, 9. It does. Like in 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 7, when Paul penned, but this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap how? Sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap how? Bountifully. The scriptures use agricultural terms like sowing and reaping to teach a spiritual principle in regard to our giving. He said in verse 7, Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him what? Give, not grudgingly or necessity, for God loveth what? A cheerful giver. So a bountiful eye belongs to a man who gives Bountifully and cheerfully, generously, not grudgingly or of necessity, not sparingly, right? Bountiful eye. What's God's promise to such a person who is liberal in their giving? Kathy? Shall be blessed. He that hath a bountiful eye shall be blessed. God blesses who? 
the generous giver. Are there other passages that teach that same principle? God blesses the generous giver. Can you think of one? John, you got one? Proverbs 11.25. What does it say? Good. Good passage to consider in connection with this text is Proverbs 11.25. The liberal soul shall be made fat. Which means... What's another word for fat? What's the meaning of that word in that connection? Prosperous. Prosperous. The word fat in that text has to do with prosperity. One of the secrets to prosperity is what? Being liberal in your giving. Did you know that? You know why some people will not prosper? is because they're too, what do you say, Kathy? Stingy. Too stingy. They're too stingy to prosper. Yeah. Liberality and prosperity go together. If you want to prosper, you need to give. You need to be generous in your giving. We need to learn that. Don't we? They do. They have, they have the opposite concept. We need to save that money, right? Hold on to that. I mean, you, you can't let go of that if you're going to prosper. Maybe we have it backwards. We have it upside down from what the book teaches. Another passage, God blesses the liberal giver. Luke 6, 38 says, give and what shall happen? It shall be given unto you. Here's a timeless principle. You will never live long enough to change it. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure. Pressed down and shaken together and running over shall men give unto your bosom. Now, how about this statement? For with the same measure that ye meet, with all it should be measured to you again. What's that telling you? What do you learn from that? For with the same measure that ye meet, with all it should be measured to you. What's that about? That's exactly right. The, we're blessed to the extent that we give. You want to be blessed out of a thimble? Give out of a thimble. You want to be blessed out of a bushel basket? Give out of a bushel basket. You want to be blessed out of a five-gallon bucket? Give out of a five-gallon bucket. You want to be blessed out of a barrel? Give out of a barrel. That's the principle. You can't outgive who? God. God cha challenged his people in the days of Malachi. If they'd give as he instructed them, that he'd open one. The windows of heaven and pour out a blessing they couldn't receive. Right? Read the book of Malachi. Remember that? It's a good principle. It does, doesn't it? Shows our faith in the Lord. Has a way of doing that. I don't know how that works always. But those who have done it have experienced it, right? Proverbs 19 and verse 17 says, He that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord, and that which he hath given will he, what? Pay him again. Pay him again. That's the idea of lending to the Lord. As you know that when you give to the poor, you're lending to the Lord. It's a great concept. Verse 10. What happens when the scorner is cast out? 
Eric? There's a real problem with contention and strife. Those suggest the presence of who? What kind of person? Evil. Evil? Who's a scorner? A mocker. One person can keep a whole group in a continual state of contention. That happens with some churches. As long as this one person is around, there's always a what? Something brewing. Something being stirred up. Turmoil. Contention. And whenever that individual is gone, guess what? What else is gone? Strife? Contention? Things are peaceful? It's interesting how that sometimes happens. But contention goes out and strife and reproach cease when the scorner is cast out. Next section, we'll read that beginning with verse 11. He that loveth pureness of heart, for the grace of his lips, king shall be his friend. The eyes of the Lord preserve knowledge, and he overthroweth the words of the transgressor. The slothful man saith, there is a lion without. I shall be slain in the streets. The mouth of strange women is a deep pit. He that is a poor of the Lord shall fall therein. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. He that oppresseth the poor to increase his riches, and he that giveth to the rich shall surely come to want. Bow down thine ear and hear the words of the wise, and apply thine heart unto my knowledge. For it is a pleasant thing if thou keep them within thee. They shall with all be fitted in thy lips, that thy trust may be in the Lord. I have made known to thee this day, even to thee. Have not I written to thee excellent things and counsels and knowledge, that I might make thee know the certainty of the words of truth, that thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that send unto thee. That's verses 11 through 21. As you consider the wise sayings of Solomon, what kind of person would you say is portrayed by these words in verse 11? Pureness of heart and the grace of his lips. What kind of person do you envision, John? A, one that loves. Becky? A righteous person. What a wonderful, beautiful person. Described in the words pureness of heart. Does that describe us? Each of us answer that within our own heart. Does that describe you? Does that describe me? Pureness of heart. He that loveth pureness of heart. Who shall be his friend? <clears throat> the king. A person with purity abiding in his heart, who has the ability to express himself in a courteous way. You know, kings may not always be virtuous, but they admire that. You take Herod, for example. Remember the regard he had for John the Baptist in Mark the 6th chapter, verse 19. Herodias had a quarrel against John would have killed him, but she couldn't. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and unholy, and observed him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. So if you want a king as a friend, you need to be among those who love pureness of heart. Matthew 5, 8 reads, Blessed are who? the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Verse 12 in the American Standard is stated this way. 
The eyes of Jehovah preserve him that hath knowledge. But he overthroweth the words of the treacherous man. Who is it that God preserves? Who is it? Jason? The one who has knowledge. What kind of knowledge? Knowledge of history? Knowledge of math? Knowledge of science? Knowledge of who? Knowledge of God and His Word. That's the kind of knowledge, spiritual knowledge. How do you get that knowledge? Through reading and study of this book. By hearing it taught. That's why we need to read it. We need to study it. In all your quest for knowledge, don't forget what? The greatest of all. This book. You can know everything else, and if you don't know this, you what? You really don't know anything. Right? Would you agree with that? You really don't know anything. If you know everything else, but you don't know this, you don't know anything at all. You agree, Daryl? You can know little about other things, but if you know what this book says, that's what's really important. That's what's valuable. In fact, the knowledge of the scriptures has the ability to make you wise unto what? Salvation. You know any other book that can do that? That can make you wise unto salvation? Remember what Paul said in addressing a young man by the name of Timothy? In 2 Timothy 3.15, he said that from a child thou hast known. <clears throat> what did he know from a child? The Holy Scriptures. And he went on to say, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. 2 Timothy 3.15. Puts an emphasis on knowledge of the scriptures, doesn't it? That's why James said in James 1.21, receive with meekness. You've got to have the right attitude. You've got to have the right heart. Meekness. Receive with meekness what? The engrafted word which is able to save your soul. James 1.21. This book can save your soul. You know any other book that can do that? How much would you be willing to pay for this book? If it's able to save your soul, what would that be worth? How much do the college textbooks cost? And you don't always get a textbook, do you? You might get a what? Access code? You're paying for a little sheet of paper? What, two or three dollars? That's about all it is anymore, isn't it? <laughs> No. How much do you pay for an access code? Two hundred dollars. Two or three hundred dollars, right? Yeah. Too much. Too much. But anyway, there's value, there's value in that. But don't underestimate the value of this book. What would you be willing to pay for it? The Bible says in Proverbs 23, 23, buy the truth and what? Sell it not. It's so valuable. You need to Pay any price to have it in your possession and don't part with it. It's priceless. It's priceless. It really is. And yet, it's taken for granted. Do you have a Bible? If not, we'll be glad to give you one. You'll have to pay a dime for it. We'll give you one. If you'd like to have one. If you don't have one, we'll give you one. And If you'll read it, believe it, and obey it. And live by it. Think of what it's able to do for you. The knowledge that it contains that you can have and able to save your soul. Can't put a price on that. Who ever would gain the whole world lose his own soul? Remember what Jesus said about that? Matthew 16, 26. What is a man profited if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Your soul is worth more than the whole world. And this book has knowledge that's able to save your soul. If you'd like to know more about that, we're available. We're able to study with you, talk with you about that. So the individual that has knowledge, knowledge of God and his will and his way and his word, 
is preserved by the Lord. What does the word preserve suggest? Preserved. Be protected. protected. He's going to endure. Last. Not everybody is preserved by the Lord. There are some who will perish. So if we want the protection that comes from being preserved by God, we need to have the knowledge of God. Remember, the way of transgressors is what? Hard. Hard. Can you think of an example of God overthrowing the words of the treacherous? He said, he overthroweth the words of the treacherous man or the transgressor. Any idea? Any thoughts about that? I thought of Sennacherib back in 2 Kings during the period of the divided kingdom. In chapter 19 and in verse 35, it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians and hundred four score and five thousand. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. Do you remember what Sennacherib said back in chapter 18, 28? Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus saith the king, Let not Hezekiah deceive you, for he should not be able to deliver you out of his hand. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us, and this city should not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. Hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus saith the king of Assyria, Make an agreement with me by a present, come out to me, and then eat ye every man of his own vine, and every one of his fig tree, and drink ye every one the waters of his sister. Until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of corn and wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of oil, olive, and of honey, that you may live and not die. Hearken not unto Hezekiah when he persuadeth you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. Hath any of the gods of the nations delivered at all his land out of the king, hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and of Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharvaim, Hena, and Iba? Have they delivered Samaria out of mine hand? Who are they among all the gods of the countries that have delivered their country out of mine hand? That the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of mine hand. Pretty bold, wasn't he? Remember what Solomon said? He overthroweth the words of the treacherous. They surely were. When you read on in that story, how that in 1935, over 100,000 corpses. Pretty good illustration of that, isn't it? Next text in Proverbs 22, verse 13. You find a sluggard's excuse for not going to work. What is it? There's a lion out there in the way. Every little thing becomes a big adversary in the way when it comes to work for some people. People do what they want to do most of the time. 99% of people do what they want to do 99% of the time. If you want to go to work, you're going to uh, you're going to get up and go to work. If you don't want to work, probably going to find an excuse not to. Right? What's the forecast for today? Oh boy, it's going to be a hot one. Too hot to work. Oh, it's going to rain. It's too, going to be too wet. Too, right? What do you do? Put on your raincoat and go ahead, right? 
If lazy people are full of excuses for not working. This same excuse is mentioned where else? 2613. I expect people that are in a management position, managers who maybe have to do with people's work schedules, have a difficult time. What do you think? With people showing up like they're supposed to. You entertain that anywhere? And people calling in, not want to work. Maybe use an excuse. I'm sick. Some people have a legitimate sickness. They can't work. But some people wake up with Wednesday morning itis. And they have it on Thursday itis and Friday itis. And whatever. Right? Where there's a will to do something, there's usually a way to do it. Where there's no will to work, there's usually an excuse not to do it. We just need to buckle up and do what needs to be done. Any comment about that, anybody? Jason? Slothful. There's slothful people that is lazy, lazy, and there's people that are industrious. Which are you going to be? You're going to have to decide that. <clears throat> You're going to have to decide that for yourself. Are you going to be a lazy bum? Or are you going to be industrious and work hard? Right? You going to get up and get to going? Or are you just going to sleep all day? You're going to have to decide that. Now's the time to do that when you're young. When you're, we got some students back in school. You got schoolwork to do, responsibilities. You're going to have to apply yourself, right? You got assignments that need to be done. Now's the time to develop some industry about you. Have a good work ethic and work hard. Apply yourself. There's a tendency on the part of everybody to, toward laziness. And we have to fight that. You have to fight it with all you got. I'm not going to be lazy today. It's easy to do that. I'm not going to be lazy. I'm going to work. I'm going to get this done. I'm going to do a good job. I'm going to do the best that I can. And that'll, you develop that now while you're young and you keep that and you'll pay many times over great dividends if you'll keep that mentality about you. Don't be slothful. Don't fall into that category of being lazy, of making excuses. Not everything's pleasant. It's not always easy. Some things are hard. Some things are unpleasant. But you got to grind it out. And it makes you appreciate when things aren't as heavy. When you accomplish that, that you weren't sure if you could survive it or not, you got it done. You accomplish that. It's a good feeling. Some people never feel that. They don't know what that feels like, that sense of accomplishment, because they don't stick to it. you got to have stick to itiveness. So work hard. Study hard. Work hard. Apply yourself. And keep that all your life. It'll serve you well, won't it, Dave? Just ask Dave. Dave has lots of experience. And... We appreciate you. What is a deep pit? Verse 14, a deep pit. Eric? The mouth of a strange woman is a deep pit. What do you know about deep pits? If you fall into one, what? Hard to get out of. Maybe impossible. Some pits are so deep, people fall in, they never walk. They never get out. They never see the light of day again. People don't know they're there. They can't get to them, maybe. The, the deeper the pit, the more difficult it is to extract yourself from that. And <clears throat> the mouth of a strange woman, he says, is a deep pit. 
So it's teaching us to do what? Stay away from, avoid the strange woman. This book has a lot to say about her, this individual. Remember these references? Maybe you jotted down some of these. Proverbs 2, verse 16, to deliver thee from the strange woman, even from the stranger which flattereth with her words, which forsaketh the guide of her youth and forgetteth the covenant of her God. For her house inclineth unto death, her paths unto the dead. None that go unto her return again, either take they hold of the paths of life. Where else you read about her? Yeah, chapter 7, verse 5 through 27. Lots of information there. Chapter 5, verse 3 through 23. Chapter 6, 24 through 35. Chapter 23, 7 and 8. She uses her mouth to break down the young man. These references talk about her mouth. Her, what kind of words? Flattering words. Flattering words. Ecclesiastes 7.26 says, listen to these words, I find more bitter than death. <clears throat> you know if anything more bitter than death? That's pretty bitter. More bitter than death, he said. The woman, did you know a woman can be more bitter than death? What kind of woman? Whose heart is snares and nets, and her hands is bands. Whoso pleased with God shall escape from her, but the sinner should be taken by her. So a strange woman is a trap, a deep pit. Stay away from her. Avoid her. Solomon said, who shall fall in this pit, this deep pit? What kind of person? That? Yes, he that is abhorred of the Lord. That means a person that is detested by God, abhorred by God. What, according to verse 15, is bound in the heart of a child? Reagan? Foolishness. Foolishness. Sometimes children do foolish things. And there's something that has the ability to drive that out of him. What is it, Keith? The rod of correction. What is the rod of correction, Charles? The rod of correction. Discipline. Discipline. It's often mentioned in this book, isn't it? The rod of correction. What if you don't use that rod? You don't use the rod of correction. What then? What do you expect to happen if you don't use the rod of correction? The, what? It stays in them. Yeah. Jason, what are you going to say? Same thing? Same thing. Chapter 13, verse 24. Listen to this. He that spareth his rod, what's, he, what's it said about him? If you spare your rod, you hate your son. So as I love my son so much, I don't what? I don't use the rod. I use it What's the word? Sparingly. What's he say about he that spareth the rod? He hateth his son, but he that loveth him, chasteneth him, be times. What's be times? Properly, promptly, when he needs it, when and where he needs it, right? You know anybody that needs to know that? How about parents with children? Need to know that. If you love your child, you're going to discipline when they need it. Properly. Properly. Chapter 19 and verse 18. 
Chasten thy son while there is hope, and let not thy soul spare for his crying. 23, 13, and 14. Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod. That tells me more about the rod. Beatest him with the rod, he shall not what? Die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod, and shalt deliver his soul from hell. 29.15 The rod and reproof give wisdom. For the child left himself, bringeth his mother to shame. We're told by a lot of people today, you can't do that. You ought not be doing that. Do they know more about it than the Lord? Foolishness in the heart of a child. It's got a way of remaining there if we don't use the rod properly. And that becomes ingrained in people. Why are they like they are today? Maybe middle-aged, older. The foolishness is still there because of parents that didn't love their children enough to help get it out of there. Just let them go unrestrained, doing whatever they want to do. They get used to that. Believe it or not, children need some proper restraints. Who was it that didn't restrain his sons? Eli, remember that? He restrained them not. And the Lord said, I'll judge his house forever. We need some restraints, don't we? Not just in a seat in the back of a car. The child restraint seat that they put you in. When, until you're about 12 years old now, isn't it? Or 16, I don't know. It seems like they keep stretching it out. Until you're old enough to drive. You go from the... All right. Too many parents don't do as the Bible teaches on that. And that we need to instill that early. They need to be taught early. That, that this book is a special book. Respect for it. And how to behave when they come into the assembly. Children can learn that. They can learn that real quick. If the parents will teach them. Teach them how to sit and listen. They can learn that. And they can teach them that at home. Instill that early. I remember Brother Connie Adams, a good, faithful, able gospel preacher, when he would come and preach in meetings and talk about this, he talked about how you deal with a child that is a little disruptive in the service, how that you take them out, you wear them out, and you bring them back in. And if that don't work, then step two kicks in. You take them out, wear them out, bring them back in. If that don't work, you go to step three. You take them out, wear them out, bring them back in. They soon learn that it's a lot more pleasant to sit and behave than it is to go be taken out, worn out, and brought back in. <laughs> There's a lot of truth in that. Consistency. Consistency is really important in that. But if that don't happen, the parents are wore out. I don't know what, what we're going to do. If you can't do something with a two-year-old, what are you going to do when they're 18? When they're 16? Are they terrible twos or terrific twos? They can be terrific. They can be. It's all in your attitude. And, and applying the wisdom of this book. Right, Nicholas, you agree? Who will end up in poverty according to verse 16? Who is it? Two people, basically, aren't they? You know, laziness and lack of industry can do that to a person. Some people are out here panhandling because they're too lazy to get a job. Not all of them, but some of them are. Some of them are. Lack of industry will lead to that. Proverbs 6 talks about that, 9 through 11. But in this text, if you oppress the poor to get gain, or you try to bribe the rich for your own advantage, 
What's that going to do? You'll surely come to want. That's need or poverty. Verses 17 through 21 urge us to listen to the good instruction we're receiving. That's a good section. 17 through this end of the section that we're reading. God's given us ears to what? To hear and to listen. And they need to be used especially when who's speaking? The wise. The wise. Right? Verse 17. Bow down thine ear and hear the words of who? The wise. Not everybody who speaks who we might listen to or words that we might hear are wise. It could be who speaking. A fool. I don't need to listen to that. Do you, Eric? If a fool is speaking? Here, tell me more. I want to hear more about that. Oh. But when the wise man's listening, I need to what? I need to be quiet and see what he has to say when a wise man's speaking. I need to listen. Look at this double command, verse 17. Incline thine ear and apply thy heart. Right? Bow down thine ear and apply thine heart. Our hearts or minds should apply what we hear. When it's words of the wise. These are wise words, by the way, that we're hearing in the book of Proverbs. And my heart needs to be applied. What's a pleasant thing? Verse 18. What's a pleasant thing? Jason? Yes, sir. Keeping those wise words within you. It is a pleasant thing if thou keep them within thee. Them what? Them words. Verse 17. Them words. Is that good grammar? It says it like an R, though, doesn't it? Bow down thine ear and hear the words of the wise. And then verse 18, keep them within thee. What will true knowledge cause us to do? Verse 19. Trust in the Lord, won't it? Trust in the Lord. That thy trust may be in the Lord. <clears throat> Remember, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Proverbs 1 7. How are the things written described in verse 20? What's the word? Excellent, excellent things. I've written under the excellent things in counsels of knowledge. And in verse 21, he gives the purpose of writing the things that he did, that I might make thee know the certainty of the words of truth, that thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that send unto thee. Great value in knowing the words of truth. Appreciate you being here tonight. We have a good crowd. Some of you have been studying hard. You've been working hard. You've got back to school, and the professors have really laid it on you, haven't they? Right out of the gate. <clears throat> and you've come to Bible study. We, we appreciate that. We commend you for that. Some of you have been working hard today, and you've come to study, to learn. You're a good example. We appreciate you. And we hope to see you this Lord's Day. Okay. Who's going to sing, lead the song? Keith's going to lead us. Get, get your songbook out. Anywhere with Jesus I can say Jesus. 
Jesus, I can safely go. Anywhere with Jesus, I am not alone. Other friends may fail me, he is still my own. Though his hand may be me over nearest ways, anywhere with Jesus is a house of praise. Anywhere, anywhere, fear I cannot know. Anywhere with Jesus I can say, Anywhere with Jesus over land and sea, telling souls in darkness of salvation free. Ready as he summons me to go or stay, anywhere with Jesus when he points away. Anywhere, anywhere, here I cannot go. If you would please grab your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1. The book of 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5. That's where we will begin our study this evening. 1 Timothy 1. Verse 5 says, Now the end of the commandment is charity, out of a pure heart, and of a good conscience, and of faith unfeigned. I want to look at those two words at the end of that verse, faith unfeigned. The word unfeigned is found four times in the King James Version. It means genuine, sincere, real. It's undisguised. It's not fake. And sadly today, there are many individuals, many members of the church even, who are not genuine in the faith. They do not have unfeigned faith, which we are taught to have. And certainly there is the need to talk about unfeigned faith and what it means to be genuine in the faith. The Bible teaches that there is one faith, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 5. Ephesians 4, verse 4 says, There is one body and one spirit, even as you are called, and one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. There is one faith. And in order for our faith to be genuine, to be unfeigned, we must be of that one faith that comes from God, that comes from His Word. And the Bible certainly teaches the importance of faith. In Hebrews 11, verse 6, it says, Without faith it is impossible to please Him. We cannot please God if we do not have faith. And therefore, I encourage us, you as well as myself, to do as is taught in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. Examine yourself, whether ye be in the faith. And if you find that you are not, genuine in the faith. May we have the courage, the conviction, to make the proper correction that we may be pleasing to God. And Matthew, if you would turn there with me, Matthew chapter 6. We'll begin reading in verse 25. The Lord is speaking. Matthew 6, verse 25. The Lord says, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, or gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, take, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto a stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Verse 30 says, Wherefore God, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, Shall I not much more clothe you, listen, O ye of little faith? From this reading, I want to point out that unfeigned faith, genuine faith, does not worry. He says, O ye of little faith. He goes on to say, Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink? Wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. If we want to be genuine in the faith, if we want unfeigned faith, We must not worry about the necessities of this life. If you continue reading in verse 33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient to the day is the evil thereof. Not only does unfeigned faith not worry, but it also seeks first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. If we want to be genuine in the faith, we must not worry. And we must seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. But also in the book of Matthew, chapter 8, 
We'll begin reading in verse 23, Matthew 8, verse 23. It says, When he was entered, that is Christ, when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, and there was a great calm. Well, in there. I want to point out that unfeigned faith, genuine faith, does not fear. No matter what the situation is that we are in, no matter how bad the storm is, if you will, that is around us, we must not fear. Remember, all things are possible with God, Matthew 19, verse 26. And Matthew 10, verse 28, teaches us, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body and hell. We must not fear if we want to be genuine in the faith, but rather trust in God, put our faith in him. But also in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We'll look at verse 5. 1 Corinthians, rather. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 5. The Bible tells us that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Notice our faith is not to stand in men, in men's writings, in the wisdom of men, in men's opinions. Rather, our faith must stand in the power of God and His Word if we want our faith to be unfeigned. In the book of Acts, chapter 14, in verse 22, we read, Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith. Notice, we are to continue in the faith. Faith is not something that we do, something that we say once, and then it's done. But rather, faith is something we continue in. It does not end. Exhorting them to continue in the faith. And that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. Understand that continuing in the faith, having unfeigned faith, is associated with, it involves, it requires tribulation in order to enter the kingdom of God. In Philippians chapter 1, and verse 29, We read, for unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. It's not enough to just believe in the Lord, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Being genuine in the faith, having unfeigned faith, requires much tribulation, suffering. And if you're not willing to endure this tribulation, to endure suffering for the Lord, then you do not have unfeigned faith. Sadly, there are many, and so often, members of the church that are faithful to the point that is comfortable for them. But as soon as the faith of the gospel, the faith in the Lord, interferes with their schedule, with their desires, their wants, with their needs, those things then become priority over the Lord. And that is certainly not unfeigned faith. We have many excellent examples of faith throughout the Bible, such as Abraham who was willing to offer his own son Isaac for the Lord. Hebrews 11, verse 17 teaches, By faith Abraham offered his own son Isaac. He was willing to offer his son to please God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel chapter 3 refused to bow down to the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, knowing that they'd be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Would we be willing to do that? Would we be willing to refuse to do anything contrary to the word of God no matter what the cost, even if it meant being thrown into a burning, fiery furnace. How is our faith? Stephen was stoned for the Lord, Acts 7, verse 58. The apostles suffered many things for the Lord, for the work of the Lord. And yet, there are members of the church today who complain about the smallest and piteous little things. There are those who won't wear a suit or won't dress up for church because it's too hot outside. There are those who miss services for school activities, classes, and clubs, for work, for sports, for worldly activities. 
There are those that aren't willing to withdraw from the disorderly or to stand up for the truth because they don't want to offend anybody. And there are those that accept things, that they go along with things, contrary to the Word of God, just to maintain relationships with those here on earth. Really, they're doing away with their relationship with the Lord to maintain relationships with members here on earth. And that is certainly not unfeigned faith. That is not genuine faith. If we aren't willing to go out of our way, to get out of our comfort zone, to do anything and everything required by the Lord in His Word, no matter what the cost, that is not unfeigned, genuine faith. That will not please God. And we really ought to be ashamed of ourselves because the Lord came to this earth and died. He was crucified for us. But also, in Acts chapter 24, in verse 24, And 25, Acts 24, 24, beginning. And after certain days, when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. Notice, Felix called for Paul to come, and he heard him concerning the faith in Christ. What did Paul teach him when he taught him the faith in Christ? we find that he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. That teaches me that there's more to faith in Christ than just believing. It takes more than just believing in Christ. Here, we're taught that it also involves righteousness, temperance, understanding, judgment to come. Now, righteousness is obedience to the truth. Righteousness comes by obeying obeying the Word of God, Romans 6, verse 16. Therefore, if you're disobedient to the Word in any way, then you are not righteous, and that means you're not faithful. It also requires temperance, which is self-control. Do you have self-control? Are you faithful? And this is so important because we are going to stand before the Lord in judgment. He's going to judge us whether we are faithful or not, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. But one more point along this line is that our faith must be a working faith. If you turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, First Thessalonians 1 and verse 3, we find the Thessalonians had a working faith, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God our Father. Just as their faith was a working faith, ours must be as well. Remember James 2, several times throughout the chapter, like 17 and verse 20 and verse 26, faith without works is dead. It's not enough to just believe. If we do not practice works, If we're not obedient to the word, those works of obedience to his word, to his commandments, then our faith is dead. It is vain. It is of no value. It will not save us. It will not please God. And there are many, many members of the church even that would be the first to tell you how faithful they are. I'm faithful to the Lord. No one has more faith than I do. I believe in the Lord. And yet the things they do, the things they say, the things they wear, the people that they associate with, the way that they lead their lives, do not line up with the Word of God. They do things contrary to the Word of God. They have sin in their life. They're disobedient. And that means that they are not faithful to the Lord. No matter how many times you say you are faithful, if you are not obedient to the Word, then you are not faithful to the Lord. You are not genuine in the faith. You do not have unfeigned faith. If you turn to Matthew chapter 7, and verse 21, the Lord Tells us here, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. The book of Luke, chapter 6. In verse 46, the Lord says, Why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? If you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Second Corinthians 10, verses 17 and 18. But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. For not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. We can't commend ourselves. Commending ourselves is not approved. If we say we're faithful, that doesn't mean we're faithful. But it is the Lord who commendeth, the Lord who approves. And we must be sure that we are perfectly in line with the word of God in order to be approved by the Lord. 
And it's this kind of faith, this unfeigned faith, that demonstrates all of these qualities that is said to be precious in 2 Peter 1 and verse 1. Do you have this faith? Do you have unfeigned faith? Are you genuine in the faith? The Bible teaches that this faith comes by hearing the word, Romans 10 verse 17. You've heard the word tonight. Do you believe it? You must believe it, Mark 16 and verse 16. You must repent of your sins, the Lord taught, Luke 13 3 and verse 5. You must confess your faith in the Lord. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, Acts 8, verse 37. You must be baptized for the remission of your sins, Acts 2, 38, into Christ, Galatians 3, verse 27. And the Lord taught you must remain faithful unto death in order to receive the crown of life, Revelation 2, and verse 10. Maybe you've done these things, but you have not been as faithful as you should. You have sinned in your life. You've been disobedient to the word. You must return to the Lord by repenting, by praying to God for forgiveness and confessing your sin. Acts 8 and 1 John 1 verse 9. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, don't delay. Come forward now while we stand and sing. Sweet are the promises, kind is the word. Dear God, any message that I never heard. Your nose but the blind to Christ, sinless I see. Be the great example is a pattern for me. Oh, oh, oh.
first one. Let us pray. Most gracious, holy, heavenly Father, as we come to the close of this day, Father, we thank you for the many blessings that have been ours to enjoy this day. We're so thankful, Father, for you, the Lord God, creator of all, and for the giving of thy son, Jesus, upon that cruel cross of Calvary for the sins of mankind. We thank you for his precious blood shed on our behalf. Father, we thank you for the privilege to be able to gather here this evening to study from the book of Proverbs, the wisdom, Father, that is contained within. So thankful for John and the way he brings it to us, Father, with, with ease and, and the severity of it, Father, helping us to understand what we need to know, Father. We're so thankful for his wife, Alicia, and their sons, Father, and for all that they do. We're thankful, Father, for our elders that guide us, Father, and lead us. We're so thankful that you have blessed him with the the willingness to do so. We pray that you'd be with them and their fam their wives as well. And for our deacons, Father, for all that they do and their wives, we're so thankful for them. We're blessed so richly. And for each and every one that re is represented here, Father, we pray that you would be with us and to bless us as we go throughout the remainder of this week. You would guide us, Father, and strengthen us, and we would let our light so shine that others might ask of the hope that is within us. And we can tell them, Father, it comes from thy written word, the Bible, the greatest book ever written. We pray, Father, that we would always have that love, Father, that is truthful and for Thee. We wouldn't let it be that unfeigned love that we, we've just read about, Father, but it would be that sincere love, living our lives for Thee. We pray, Father, at this time for all those who are mentioned as sick and afflicted with COVID and with a brain tumor, Father, we pray that You would be with these folks and to bless them. We ask that you continue to watch over them and, and strengthen them with their health, if it be thy will. We're mindful of Richard, Father. We pray that you would bless him, that he can be back out with us again soon. Father, we ask you to please be with us now. And as we live this building, Father, we ask that you dismiss us in thy love and care. We thank you so much for Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. <laughs>